All right, so now <clears throat> cut. All right, so now that we've cut cut. All right, so now that we've covered the osteology All right, so in this lecture, we're going to continue talking about the leg, and in this lecture, we're going to talk about the blood vessels, nerves, and clinical pearls relevant to the leg region. Now the blood vessels of the leg region. So the popliteal artery, as you can see here, traveling in the, in the popliteal fossa here in the posterior aspect of the knee here, it comes down and it bifurcates into the anterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial artery just below this uh, popliteus muscle right here. So here's the popliteus muscle. So just below there it bifurcates. And the anterior tibial goes really into the anterior compartment and the posterior tibial artery travels in the posterior compartment. So first we'll talk about the anterior tibial. So the anterior tibial, it branches off the popliteal artery near the distal end of the popliteus, like we said. Then it passes between the tibia. So remember the bifurcation happens on the posterior aspect here. It's almost in the posterior compartment of the leg is where the bifurcation happens. So the anterior tibial has got to get to the anterior compartment. So it passes between the tibia and fibula, and you can see that here. So here's your fibula right here. Here's your tibula right, tibia right here. And then here's that anterior tibial artery coming out from that bifurcation and then coming down and traveling in the anterior compartment because this is an anterior view. Here's your uh, patella here, femur here. So it travels through this opening in the superior region of the inner osseous membrane. Here's the inner osseous membrane right here, uh, right below or deep to the artery. So the anterior tibial artery, which you can also be seen here, so here it is coming out through that opening between the fibula and the tibia here, and it comes out here, descends down the, in the anterior compartment, and it travels with the deep perineal nerve, and this is an error in your book. It says deep perineal artery. Please correct that to nerve. There's no such thing as the deep perineal artery. So it travels with the deep perineal nerve, and it travels, this is an important spatial relationship, so it travels with the nerve, and it travels between the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum longus. Now you can see extensor digitorum longus right here. So EDL right here. And then tibialis anterior is actually right here. So TA is this uh, lo long, thin muscle belly right here, traveling this region right here. And you can see the tendon coming out this way. So you can see it traveling very beautifully right, be right between these two muscles. That's a spatial relationship you definitely want to be aware of. Uh, you definitely want to be aware of that on a cross-sectional. If you have like a practical exam and they give you cross-sections, you want to be aware of that spatial. So the, the nerve and the artery travel together between those two muscles, extensor digitorum longus and tibialis anterior. Then it comes down here and right about here at the ankle joint, right about at these extensor retinaculums here, it continues on. It's the same structure. It's the same thing as where the extener, external iliac continues on as the femoral artery past the inguinal ligament. It's the same structure. It's just where it's traveling. So here it becomes the dorsalis pedis. And you may have heard of the dorsalis pedis pulse which is, you know, can be palpated on the dorsal surface of the foot. So the dorsalis pedis artery uh, becomes that at the ankle uh, joint midway between the lateral and medial malleoli, which are bony provinces on either aspect of the ankle joint. So posterior tibial, so back to this posterior view, popliteal comes down, anterior goes and travels in the anterior portion. So then you have posterior tibial here, which travels in the posterior compartment. And again, it branches off the popliteal artery near the distal end of the popliteus muscle travels in the posterior compartment, travels with the tibial nerve. So here's the tibial nerve coming down this way. Remember the sciatic nerve comes down and it bifurcates into that tibial nerve and then the common perineal, which will wrap around this way. And then it passes posterior to the medial malleolus. So the medial malleolus will be right about here. And it travels posterior to that with that tibial nerve. So that's an important spatial relationship to be aware of. It gives off the perineal or fibular artery, which travels in the deep part of the posterior compartment between the tibialis posterior and the flexor hallucis longus. So it's going to give off and travel down in this, deep, in this deep region right here. And that supplies the posterior and lateral compartments of the leg. After it comes down here, and we'll talk about this in the foot lecture, it comes down here and it bifurcates into the medial and lateral plantar arteries in the foot. And that, those travel on the plantar surface. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just some major veins to be aware of. So the great saphenous vein, this is kind of analogous to the basilic vein in the upper extremity. So it's the longest vein in the entire body, and it extends along the entire lower extremity. So as you can see here, it arises from this dorsal venous arch of the foot, similar to the venous arches in the hand. And this here it is traveling up all the way along this way, entire, across the entire extremity. And actually here, 
is where it terminates up here in the femoral triangle. We'll talk about more about that in a second. So it travels anterior to the medial malleolus. So the medial malleolus would be right here. And then it ascends along the medial aspect of the leg parallel to the saphenous nerve. Saphenous vein, saphenous nerve. Remember the saphenous nerve is a nerve that comes off of the femoral nerve. Remember the femoral nerve comes off and just after it passes the inguinal ligament, it, it spreads off into a bunch of branches. And one of those branches is the saphenous nerve, which then comes down on this medial aspect traveling with the saphenous vein. It passes posterior to the medial condyles of the tibia and the femur at the knee joint. So right above this region right here. And then it also ascends along the medial aspect of the thigh. So here's a zoomed in uh, picture of that femoral triangle again. So here's your lateral border of sartorius, medial border, adductor longus, and then here's your inguinal ligament, superior border. Here's your navel, remember nerve, artery, uh, vein, empty space, lymphatics. So here's your femoral vein right here. And so the great saphenous vein, when it gets up in this region, it travels through the saphenous opening in the fascia lata, so that thick connective tissue sheath around the thigh, pierces the femoral sheath, which encases this neurovascular structure, and then empty, empties into the femoral vein in the femoral triangle. And you can see that beautifully right here. So here's a great saphenous vein labeled for you. It comes up like this, empties right into the femoral vein. Near the saphenous opening, it receives couple of veins. First, and it corresponds to these arteries that we talked about. So the external putendal vessels. So you can see that right here. Here's the artery coming off the femoral artery, but here's the vein coming in this way, draining this region, coming into the saphenous. And then it also receives the superficial epigastric. So here's the superficial epigastric vessels here. This, here's this vein coming in like this. And then the superficial circumflex iliac uh, veins as well. So coming in like this. Here's the artery going out that way. And one thing to be a note of is, you know, veins are very variable. You know, arteries typically are pretty consistent. Nerves are almost always very, very, you know, what what they are in the textbook. You know, not too much variability with nerves. Arteries probably second place. There's, you know, arteries are pretty consistent, but you could see some variability. Veins are, you know, they they kind of do their own thing. They, the veins are very variable. So, you know, this diagram shows it where some of these are training just directly into the femoral vein. Don't be surprised if you see that in your cadaver. But one thing to be aware of is that they could definitely drain into the great saphenous vein right before it drains into the femoral vein. So that's where there could be some variability. These veins can empty into the saphenous, the great saphenous, or they could empty in directly into the femoral vein. Great saphenous vein, it can also receive the accessory saphenous vein and forms an anastomosis with the small saphenous vein as well. So some quick clinical pearls with the saphenous vein. So like other superficial veins, it can form varicose veins, which are swollen, twisted, and lengthened vessels that are cosmetically undesirable. So these don't really do anything to you health-wise other than they just don't, they don't look nice. And there's actually some vascular surgeons out there making a lot of money taking these out and fixing these for people. And another thing is the saphenous vein can be affected by thrombophlebitis, which basically is venous inflammation resulting in thrombus formation. And these thrombi, thrombi that form, they can potentially become a convulmonary embolus. So this is a pretty serious condition because it can potentially result in a pretty devastating outcome with a pulmonary embolus. Another big thing, so this is huge with surgery. So it's routinely harvested during cardiac surgery and used for coronary artery bypass grafting, so cabbage surgery. The thing about harvesting this vein is because that saphenous nerve, SN, is traveling right there during the harvest, so they'll usually harvest it down here in the leg, during that, during that harvest, you could potentially damage the saphenous nerve, and so definitely want to be aware of that spatial relationship. It can also be used for a venipuncture or even for a vein cut down in emergency situations. So the small saphenous vein, it arises from the dorsal venous arch of the foot, so right in here, and then you can see where it travels up this way. So it's this large vein right here. small saphenous vein traveling up kind of in the midline on the posterior aspect of the leg. And so it comes up, it travels posterior to the lateral malleolus right here, and then ascends along the posterior aspect of the superficial leg because it's a superficial vein, and it's parallel to the sural nerve, which is right here. So the sural nerve is a nerve that forms from branches of both the common perineal and the tibial nerve, and we'll talk about that in the nerve section a little bit here. So, but that's an important spatial relationship. Posterior aspect, traveling with the sural nerve superficially. The sural nerve is a cutaneous nerve, so it makes sense it's gonna be traveling superficial. Then it comes up here, it passes between the heads of the gastrocnemius muscle, and then terminates into that popliteal vein, which is traveling with the popliteal artery between the two heads of the gastrocnemius as well. All right, so now to go over the nerves in the leg region. First, the tibial nerve. So, as we've talked about earlier, is that here's the sciatic nerve here. 
The sciatic nerve comes down and in the popliteal fossa, it bifurcates into this common perineal nerve, which then goes on to give rise to that deep perineal and superficial perineal nerve. And then the other branch off the bifurcation of the sciatic nerve is the tibial nerve. And this goes down through the posterior compartment of the leg. Now we define for each of these nerves, the motor innervation and the sensory innervation. So the motor innervation is, as we talked about, all the muscles in the posterior compartment of the leg. So any muscle in this compartment, it's going to be tibial nerve innervation. So that's easy to remember. Just remember which compartment it's in. Sensory innervation is going to do part of the posterior lateral aspect of the leg. So some of this part right in here with the sural nerve and then the lateral aspect of the so and the sole of the foot. And so this, you can see it actually, it's even labeled here in the diagram. So here the sole of the foot and then some of the lateral aspect as well. So the course of the nerve, the sciatic nerve, like we said, it bifurcates in the popliteal fossa and the common perineal and the tibial. We'll focus on the tibial here. Tibial travels, travels down with the posterior tibial artery because remember the popliteal artery bifurcates in this region as well into the anterior and posterior tibial artery. So posterior tib and then anterior tib. So this is going to come down and travel with the tibial nerve, so posterior tibial artery. So that's an important anatomical relationship to be aware of. And it'll go down all the way in the posterior compartment of the leg, just deep to that soleus muscle. So remember, there's gastrocnemius is most superficial. Then you have soleus just uh, beneath that. And then just deep to that, you'll have this neurovascular bundle of the nerve and the artery traveling together. So we look at this diagram. So the sural nerve we'll talk about in a few slides here. This is the medial side. This is the lateral side. So the common perineal nerve is on the lateral aspect of the fibula. And so that makes sense that it's going to give off that lateral sural cutaneous nerve, which is going to come off this way. Then the tibial nerve gives off the medial sural cutaneous nerve, which comes this way. And then they come down here to join to form the sural nerve. So the tibial nerve, when it gets down here in the distal aspect of the leg, it travels cl pretty close to the tibia. And then here's the medial malleolus, and it passes just posterior to that medial malleolus with the posterior tibial artery. And then remember those, those tendons coming in here as well, extensor hallucis longus, extensor digitorum, and then tibialis posterior. All three of those tendons are traveling posterior to this medial malleolus as well. And we'll talk about that spatial relationship in the ankle lecture. So the tibial nerve will terminate deep to the flexor retinaculum by dividing into the medial and lateral plantar nerves, which then go on to innervate the foot. And remember, the posterior tibial artery divides into the medial and lateral plantar arteries. So plantar, lateral and medial plantar nerves, and those go on to innervate the foot. So clinical tie in here, if you have a tibial nerve injury, so the nerve gets lacerated, it gets damaged uh, and pinched somewhere along here, they can lo cause loss of plantar flexion and impaired inversion of the foot. And that makes sense because it, the tibial nerve supplies all these muscles in the posterior compartment. Remember, what is the posterior compartment? The main responsibilities are plantar flexion. And then they also do inversion of the foot is what some of these muscles will do. So those are the two main things. So it makes sense. You de-innervate these muscles that may do these functions. You're going to lose these actions. So presentation, the difficulty with stepping off the ground. So if you remember, plantar flexion is really what helps you step off. So that makes sense. Clawing of the toes and the numbness on the sole of the foot, which makes sense that, you know, that this would be the tibial nerve it provides innervation, cutaneous innervation of the sole of foot, and then all of which can affect posture and gait. So these people can affect with poor posture. They can present with impaired gait. And so these are all things to be aware of. So the common perineal nerve is the other nerve that arises from the bifurcation of the sciatic nerve at the popliteal fossa. So here's your tibial, here's your common perineal, this is your posterior view. Here's that bifurcation here. You can see it start to wrap around from the posterior aspect. And then here on the anterior surface here, you see it wrapping around here, around the fibular head to enter into the lateral compartment. Injury can result in a foot drop and numbness over the dorsum of the foot. That's because the common perineal gives rise to the deep perineal, which supplies the anterior compartment doing major dorsiflexion and then numbness over the dorsum because between the superficial perineal and deep perineal, they do the skin over the dorsal surface. After leaving the popliteal fossa, it travels superficial to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscle, which the head would be just in here. And then in here, remember, it's that it has those two heads that right below the popliteal fossa. And then it wraps around the head of the fibula, which you can see very nicely here. Here it's wrapping around and coming to give that bifurcation. For the sural nerve, it gives off the lateral sural cutaneous nerve. So 
This is lateral out here. This is medial here. So remember your medial is coming from the tibial. This is the lateral sural cutaneous coming from common perineal. They join together here to form the sural nerve, which you can see coming down on the posterior aspect of the leg. So the common perineal nerve, after it gives off that lateral sural cutaneous nerve in the posterior aspect, then it wraps around the fibular head. Then after that, it, it bifurcates into the superficial perineal nerve, which you can see here labeled, which goes down through the lateral compartment, and then the deep perineal nerve, which then goes through the anterior compartment. And the important anatomical landmark to note is that the, this bifurcation occurs deep to the perineus longus muscle. So first, the superficial perineal nerve, motor innervation to only two muscles. You got to remember perineus longus and brevis muscles. Then the sensory innervation, so it does a lot more sensory innervation. It does the skin on the lateral side of the lower leg and the dorsal surface of the foot, and you can really see that right here. This whole yellow region right here, this is all superficial perineal nerve. So lateral, anterior surface of the leg, dorsal surface of the foot. And so the course of it, as you can see here, it descends on the lateral compartment between the perineus muscles, so between perineus longus and brevis, and then the, and the extensor digitorum longus muscles. So you can see that going here. Here's extensor digitorum longus, and where it's actually kind of pulled away as you, in this diagram, if you can kind of see these hooks here, pulling the muscle aside like you would do in the cadaver lab. So it goes down between the perineus muscles and then this muscle, pierces the deep fascia of the leg to enter the sub-Q space, so that's in this region right here, so then it can carry out. So it's given off its muscular branches here, then it comes down here, pierces that fat deep fascia, and then goes in to do its uh, cutaneous innervation. So here's a uh, zoomed-in view of the ankle. So actually this is right here just before the ankle. It does, you know, this would be your superficial perineal nerve coming down here, and then just before... The ankle, it splits into the medial, dorsal, and intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerves, and you can actually see those here. And these nerves travel across here, and these are what provide the cutaneous innervation to the dorsal surface. So really, these knowing these two nerves is not terribly high yield. It's more just to know that it splits into two nerves here, and then that covers the dorsal aspect. So the deep perineal nerve, so it does all the muscles in the anterior compartment of the leg. And then it also does two muscles in the foot which we'll talk about in the foot lecture, the extensor hollis brevis and the extensor digitorum brevis. Sensory innervation, it does the skin of the web space between the first and second digits. So, and you can see that labeled here, this little green section right here. So the course of it, it arises from the bifurcation. So here's superficial perineal nerve, common perineal nerve, and then it goes down deep, and you can see it actually traveling here. Here's deep perineal nerve traveling here. And so it arises from that bifurcation deep to the perineus longus. It travels in the anterior compartment, as you can see, with the anterior tibial artery just over that inner osseous membrane. So it travels in the, kind of the deeper part of the, of the compartment. And then it's located deep to the extensor digitorum longus muscle. And so here's that extensor digitorum kind of pulled away. As you can see, here's these hooks right here kind of retracting it out of the way because otherwise it would just be superficial to the neurovascular bundle here. Here's a good view of the ankle as it approaches. So here's a deep perineal nerve right here, traveling here, traveling with the artery, you can see right here. So as it approaches the ankle, it travels with the anterior tibial artery between the tibialis anterior, which you can see right here. So this is TA, and extensor hollis is longus muscle. So here's EHL. So between these two muscles and then eventually between these two tendons, it bifurcates just deep to the inferior extensor retinaculum. So you can see it here where it bifurcates into a medial and lateral branches that innervate the foot. So you can see that here is the lateral branch going this way. Here's the medial branch going that way. So the sural nerve, it's strictly a cutaneous nerve. It does not do any motor innervation. It does the skin on the posterior lateral aspect of the leg, ankle, and foot. And here you can see here in this dermatome map right here, all in purple, it does this whole section here. This would be lateral, medial. So really, the leg, you want to think of lateral as sural nerve, medial as saphenous nerve, and that makes sense because the saphenous vein goes up the medial aspect. Here's the sural nerve traveling right here on the posterior aspect. So its structure, it, like we said, it's formed superficial to the gastrocnemius muscle halfway down the leg. So here's about halfway. Here's where it's formed. It's formed by the sural communicating branch, which extends inferior medially from the lateral sural cutaneous nerve from the common perineal. So that's coming in this way. So you'd have common perineal here gives off lateral sural cutaneous, and then that gives rise to the sural communicating branch, which is right here, which comes off of this lateral sural cutaneous. 
then this this sural communicating branch communicates with the medial sural cutaneous, which is coming off the tibial nerve, coming in this way, it gives rise to the sural nerve, which travels down here. It descends subcutaneously, which makes sense because it's a cutaneous uh, nerve or provides cutaneous innervation. Uh, the posterior lateral side of the leg with the small saphenous vein, which is shown right here, so small saphenous vein. Then it travels laterally to pass posterior and under the lateral malleolus. So you can see that right here where it travels just under that lateral malleolus. And then it also travels along the lateral aspect of the foot, which you can actually see here. So the saphenous nerve, as we talked about, so here's the femoral nerve in the femoral triangle here. Here it comes in, and as you can see it, spreads out in all these branches as it comes out from under the inguinal ligament. And one of the branches is the saphenous nerve, which travels through that adductor canal. And then remember, it kind of breaks away and has its own exit. Then it comes down here and travels in the superficial aspect in the knee and the leg region. And you can see here, this is marked in red here in this lateral aspect. This is saphenous nerve, does a lot of the medial aspect of the leg cutaneous innervation. So here it actually says does skin over the anterior and posterior medial aspects of the leg, ankle, and foot. So all that different innervation. Strictly a sensory nerve, so it does not do any motor innervation. So here we've zoomed in to show you the structure. It becomes superficial nerve at the knee, so it's traveling in this region right here. And actually you can see it labeled right here. This only shows the superficial nerves. So as you can see here, it's traveling this way right here. And at the knee and then it let and at the leg it travels along the anterior medial side of the leg with the great saphenous vein and you can see that here in the vein would be actually be remember it forms that dorsal network and then it travels up through the medial aspect of the leg and then all the way up in the thigh and then empties into the femoral vein in the in the femoral triangle so here's a saphenous uh, nerve coming down this way passes anterior to the medial malleolus so you can see that here here's the medial malleolus right here so mm passes anterior to that with the great saphenous vein to then enter the foot. So the vein comes down this way too. So dermatomes, again, just like all other dermatomes, there's a bunch of different you know, dermatome maps out there. So just stick with what is specifically tested by your professor. That's what I would use. Uh, as far as the board exams go, just know the general distribution. So know that saphenous nerve here is the medial aspect, anterior medial aspect. As you can see here on the posterior aspect, it also does medial aspect as well. Know that superficial perineal nerve does a lot of the distal and mid, kind of midsection lateral aspect of the leg as well, and then does the dorsal aspect of the foot with the exception of this web space between the first and second toes. Know that the surface and that web space is done by deep perineal nerve. On the posterior aspect here, know that the sural nerve does a lot of the posterior lateral aspect as well. With the foot, we'll go through this more so, but remember that saphenous nerve comes down here and does some of the medial aspect of the foot. Tibial nerve does this posterior aspect near the heel. Sural nerve comes down and does this lateral aspect right here. And remember these medial plantar and lateral plantars, which come off the tibial nerve, do this aspect as well. All right, so now we're gonna talk about a couple of clinical pearls relevant to the leg region. First, compartment syndrome. Now we talked about this in the upper extremity. And now we'll just mention again here in the lower extremity, it's very common to happen in the anterior compartment of the leg. And so just to remind you, it's, it's the same pathological concept. It's the same causes, same treatment. It's just here to serve as a reminder. And remember, it, it can happen in you know, any compartment of the leg, any compartment in the, in the arm or forearm. So it's, it's, this is just a very important problem to be aware of, especially when working in the hospital. You definitely don't want to miss this in somebody because it could end up leading to someone needing an amputation and definitely want to be able to identify this on a board exam as well. So again, it, to, just to remind you, it's local trauma and soft tissue destruction. It leads to bleeding and or edema, buildup of fluids that are going to cause increase in pressure in the compartment. So the increased compartment pressure, it can lead to compression of major arteries, nerves, and muscles, which is important. So let's say we have this anterior compartment right here. Let's say we have, you know, some, that someone breaks their tibia. They have a bunch of blood that builds up, a bunch of edema. You know, these compartments are great because they help, you know, compartmentalize the function and the innervation and everything. But they also make it where it's containing, you know, fluids. And so by increasing the pressure, there's nowhere for it to go. So the pressure builds up and builds up, and then it ends up compressing on the neurovascular bundle traveling here. Here's where that anterior tibial artery in deep perineal nerve are traveling so it can compress on that if it's the anterior compartment and so and then it can eventually even just compress on the muscles and, and when you press on the muscles you can uh, cause ischemia because you're also compressing the blood vessels in the muscles so 
Long and short of it is, is it can result in ischemia from blood vessel compression, paralysis from nerve compression and or myonecrosis, which is, you know, ischemia and death of muscle cells and tissue, again, from compression of the, the muscles itself. Causes can include fractures, crush injuries, so some, some big heavy, you know, machinery falls on someone's leg and, you know, causes a lot of, you know, damage and destruction within the compartment and, you know, even maybe even a broken bone and that can increase edema, bleeding. Gunshot wounds comes in, lacerates an artery, causes damage, inflammation, tight casts or external wrappings, so too tightly wrapping around the outside of the leg can, you know, press in on the compartment. Uh, burns, because burns cause a lot of inflammation and swelling, post-ischemic swelling, and then arterial injury. Presentation, so you definitely want to be aware of these signs. So the big one you want to be aware of is pain with passive motion. So you passively move their leg and they're going to scream with pain. That's the most specific sign for compartment syndrome. Another thing is paresthesia and hyposthesia, which are really indicative if there's nerve ischemia, nerve compression. Paralysis would be a later finding because you have long-term compression of the nerve. Palpable swelling. So the, the quick the quick way you test for this is you you uh, palpate and squeeze each of the compartments and all the extremities. So if you feel uh, extra tightness or increased pressure, definitely be aware of that. Absent pulse. That's something that sometimes people will think of, but that's a later finding. If you find an absent pulse, so say you you know it's in the anterior compartment here and the anterior tibial artery, and then you do a dorsalis pedis pulse, you palpate that and it's diminished or gone. That's unfortunately a later finding because it's over time, it's so much compression is can decrease the blood flow and then often amputation is necessary. It, when you do find this, the, you know, if you're not amputating, the treatment initially is emergent surgical fasciotomy, which is where you, you know, you would cut in here and then you just cut the fascial case around, around the compartment and that releases the pressure out. All right, so now we'll talk about injuries to the common perineal nerve and its branches, the deep perineal nerve and superficial perineal nerve. So if you remember, you know, it comes around, as we show here, it comes around that fibular head there, and then it bifurcates into the superficial perineal nerve, common perineal nerve, and then deep perineal nerve here. And this is important to know. So we're talking about, so we're going to talk about where you get damage here versus here and here. So you get damage in the common perineal nerve. The presentation is going to correspond to loss of both the deep perineal nerve and the superficial perineal nerve. And so one thing to notice is that the common perineal nerve palsy, even though it's a short nerve, it can result from compression at the fibular head because it, it, it's really right up against that bone, so it's very easily compressed. So, you know, it's on the lateral or aspe outside aspect of the leg. So a leg hit by a car from the lateral side is a very common board exam question is where someone gets hit from the side by, you know, the bumper of a car on the fibular head of their leg, then they have a foot drop and some numbness in their foot. Another example is hyperflexion of the knee, prolonged bed rest, or even pressure from an obstetrics uh, stirrup. So a woman, you know, in a, in a uh, gynecologist or obstetrics office. So how is it going to present? Foot drop due to de-innervation of the muscles in the anterior compartment, so loss of dorsiflexion. So that would be your uh, deep perineal nerve. And it can also have numbness over the lateral leg and the dorsum of the foot because that's from superficial perineal nerve. So, because remember, the lesion is proximal to the bifurcation. So, it's the, the presentation is going to be a result of loss of both these nerves. So, deep perineal nerve palsy. So, again, we'll draw this out here. So, here's common perineal nerve. It bifurcates into superficial perineal nerve, deep perineal nerve. So, this is distal to the bifurcation here. So, it's going to, you know, it happen somewhere in here. Superficial perineal nerve is normal, so you're still getting this cutaneous innervation of the dorsal aspects. Deep perineal nerve is affected. So it's uh, this isolated injury to this nerve is possible with trauma to the lateral knee or the anterior leg, so some kind of injury right in here. It can also be affected by diseases ju that just affect neurons, so lower motor neuron disease, diabetes, is ischemia, and infectious disease, or inflammatory diseases. So how do these patients present? They have a foot drop because this deep perineal nerve does all these anterior compartment muscles, which do dorsiflexion. So loss of dorsiflexion is going to give you your foot drop. But however, they're not going to have any sensory loss because the superficial perineal nerve is intact. I guess so theoretically they could have decreased pinprick sensation in this 
uh, web space here between the first and second toes. But otherwise, the dorsum of the foot is not going to be numb because you're going to have superficial perineal nerve still intact. Another thing about foot drop, so if you remember, the other thing that can give you foot drop is disc herniation. So if you remember the disc herniation, it's more likely they're going to have back pain. It's going to be some kind of cause like they had, you know, some kind of injury at the back. They were moving something or lifting something improperly. And they have that sciatica type pain where it radiates from the back all the way down the leg versus the perineal nerve or common perineal nerve injury is, you know, they got hit in the side of the leg, some kind of trauma to the leg. You know, it's all about context versus presentation and also other associated symptoms. So low, is there low back pain or not? Do they have a history of back problems, any kind of injury to the back or is it injury to the leg? Do they have numbness or not over this area, specific area? So those are the things to be. So that's going to be kind of your differential with foot drop is, you know, common perineal nerve or deep perineal nerve palsy or a disc herniation in the lumbar spine. Superficial perineal nerve palsy. So again, we have common perineal nerve like this, bifurcates into superficial perineal nerve like this, deep perineal nerve here. This is where it's again distal to the bifurcation, but it's on superficial perineal nerve side deep perineal nerve is still intact this isolated injury is possible with superficial injuries to the lateral leg because remember the nerve travels out here on the lateral aspect of the leg it can result in the patient unable to evert the foot because it, the superficial perineal nerve while it does do a lot of cutaneous innervation it innervates perineus longus and brevis and these are the main uh, everters of the foot so the superficial perineal nerve palsy is going to most notably result in numbness over the lateral leg and the dorsum of the foot and you can see that right here on the dermatome map. This is the you know the region innervated by the superficial perineal nerve, and it's going to be not it not include though the web space between the great and second toes. So this little web space here in green will not be numb, and that's because that's innervated by the deep perineal nerve. So just to review again, you have common perineal nerve like this. It bifurcates into superficial perineal nerve here, deep perineal nerve here. So if you knock out common perineal nerve, you're going to lose both. You'll have numbness in this region right here. You'll have numbness in the web space as well because you've lost deep perineal nerve. You'll have foot drop because you've lost the anterior compartment. If you knock out deep perineal nerve, you still have all this yellow intact because superficial perineal nerve is okay. It's distal to the bifurcation. You're still going to have foot drop and you'll have numbness in this little web space here. If you knock out superficial perineal nerve, you, you do not have foot drop, you have loss of eversion of the foot, and then you have numbness in this yellow area here, so the lateral and dorsal aspect of the lateral aspect of the leg, dorsal aspect of the foot, with the exception of the web space. And that finishes out our discussion of the blood vessels, the nerves, and the clinical pearls relevant to the leg region.